All right, so this is uh, yet another podcast uh, for Objective Cologne. Uh, this time with me on the other side of the pond, uh, we have Mr. Lex Friedman. Hi, Lex. Hi, how are you? I'm doing fine. So first of all, let, uh, tell me where you are exactly. Tell the people where you are exactly. I am in central New Jersey on the east coast of the U.S., uh, not too far from New York. It's actually very convenient that you are on the east coast. Uh, it's uh, to make a podcast. It's more convenient than being on the west coast. Because yes. Because the time difference makes it easier. Totally. Seriously easier. So give us a little bit of background about uh, where you're from and, and what's your, uh, I would say, uh, where do you enter in this Apple industry? So, you know, for years I was working at various internet companies, but my, you know, lifelong passion had been Macs, really. You know, I, our first computer in the house was a Commodore 64, and we had a K-Pro and a TRS-80, but when we got the Apple IIc, and then our first Mac, I think, was an LC, uh, I was hooked. And so I was working these various internet jobs, but always very, very eager to keep up on what was going on in the Apple ecosystem. In the Apple community. And one day uh, I was at my day job and I saw a tweet where <laughs> someone suggested, uh, I think it was Jason Snell, who was uh, at the time the editor in chief at Macworld, tweeted, If you want to write reviews of iPhone apps for Macworld, email this person. So I emailed that person who uh, uh, was Philip Michaels, also a, a former Macworld editor. And they had me writing. Uh, reviews of iPhone apps for uh, months and months, and I really loved it. And eventually I said, you know what, I want to do this full-time. So I joined Macworld first as a staff writer and eventually as a senior writer, uh, and I was just covering all kinds of Apple news there uh, for years. That's pretty cool. And then uh, there was this uh, kind of switch to the podcasting world, right? So, yeah, I mean, what happened was when I was at Macworld, I started a podcast, and that podcast was, uh, you know... We the network that we were on was trying to sell ads for the show, but wasn't having a ton of success selling ads for the show. So I said, do you care if I try to sell ads for the podcast? And they said, no, go ahead. So I started trying to sell ads and found, to my great surprise, that I was pretty good at it, although I had no ad sales experience. Um, but then, the, you know, Glenn Fleischman, who had another show on the network at the time, said, well, will you try selling my show too? And I said, I could do that. And then the network said, why don't you sell all 15 of our shows? And I said, I can do that too. <laughs> and then more and more people kept reaching out to me and saying, uh, you know, do you want to do you want to add additional shows to your network? Like, will you take on our shows too? And I kept saying yes. And uh, eventually I joined up with Midroll to go full time. <laughs> And uh, start selling, just doing nothing but selling podcast yeah. ads. Now at this company, we were at more than two hundred shows. I, I was gonna, I, I was just gonna say, eventually you started selling the uh, advertising for all the podcasts in the world. Uh. <laughs> yeah, we we don't have all of them, but uh, a lot. You know, we have a lot, and so that's good. Yeah. Yeah, I actually um, recently discovered that you even had uh, German podcasts, which I which that's I, right. I didn't even know. Uh, yeah, uh, bits and so. Yeah, right? exactly. You probably say it better than I do. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just bits and so. Uh, but um, the, the the funny thing about it is that I I realized and I heard bits and so uh, in the past that it's uh, uh, one of my uh, friends at Boeing's doing doing that podcast. Uh, so uh, um, and since uh, there's another speaker from the same company, Boeing's, uh, they make a bunch of very interesting apps. Uh, among other stuff, uh, Boings TV and Photo Magico and all those sure. stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it's it's funny and it's also uh, it's also uh, good to see that there are uh, good podcasts uh, that are not uh, in the U.S. Uh, that are uh, have pretty big audiences in in Germany or in France for that matter. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. you know, it's there are we 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 see more and more requests from people who want to know about international shows, shows from outside the U.S. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, right now there's kind of a chicken and egg problem for us where we don't have a bunch of shows that are international, but then we have advertisers who want the international, we don't have them. We have to just say yes to a bunch of shows and advertisers at the same time, and then we can make it work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and I really like the fact that you are uh, also from the, this podcasting world because I, I keep on repeating that this whole Apple community thing started with podcasting for me because back in 2005, I started this podcast just for the fun of it, and, and it turns out I was the first... Uh, a French podcast about Apple because nobody else had thought about it. 
And from a day to the other, I started entering in this world where I got to meet developers. I was I was not a Mac developer back in the days, uh, and there was no iPhone, which is something we, right. we, we, we keep on having to remember people. You know, back in the days, there was no iPhone. Uh, and so I finally became an iPhone developer myself uh, because of the podcast, so to say, uh, generally. Um, anyway, let's move on to um, you coming to Objective Cologne. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having accepted uh, twice in a row, I would say. <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. I'm excited. Yeah. Um, and um, the other thing that, uh, well, first of all, maybe you can answer why you, uh, um, why you are excited and why you um, accepted my invitation. You know, so to me, one of the coolest things about being, you know, a part of the Apple community early on was getting invited to go to these conferences. And so, you know, I spoke at Ool in Dublin several years ago when I was at Alt WWDC and I spoke at um, the... Uh, Guy English's conference uh, in Canada, uh, may it rest Singleton. in peace. Right. And, you know, after doing several of those, I found each time, and I, I did uh, one more thing in, in Melbourne, Australia, oh, yeah. and each time, you know, you, you're traveling to a cool place, you're meeting a bunch of cool people who all are passionate about things that are at least similar to the things that you're passionate about. <laughs> Uh, you get to share ideas and then hear a, a whole bunch more. And so I enjoy the presenting part. That's fun. But getting to see everybody else's presentation, getting to meet all the people who care enough that they choose to attend. Yeah. Uh, it's just, uh, there's no aspect of it that isn't fun. So it's it's pretty easy to look forward to because it's just a bunch of very rewarding things that happen all at once. Mm -hmm. There's something very special into you coming is that uh, up until now, everybody's doing kind of one talk and uh, we you decided or we decided in common that you're going to do something like two talks because there were two talk uh, in the air that you could have given and at one point we decided okay we're going to give this this talk about uh, about Apple which we'll speak about later um, as the real talk but the first day where everybody is going to be coding or helping people or hacking uh, you will give an interesting workshop so maybe you can yeah. explain a little bit what it will be about so the the workshop, if I recall correctly, that's the one where it's uh, think like a podcast exactly. ad salesperson. And so, you know, it's funny when I uh, I was um, I, I gave a talk in England last year, and I had pitched that talk as one of the potentials. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the folks running the conference said, you know, we think that could be a cool con uh, a cool talk, but we're not sure it's right. So it does not, not right for that audience, which was fine. And I gave a different talk instead. And then in the middle of that talk, I said, you know what? I'm already here and I, I'm going to show you the talk they didn't want you to see because I'm on stage. They already flew me here. It's fine. And so I did just a couple of slides of it for fun and then went back to the main talk. But the idea for me is uh, I have concluded that kind of everything and it's because it's what I do for a living now is I sell podcast ads. Everything in life um, can be looked at through a sales perspective. And so kind of what the talk will be about is, you know, one thing I try to do as a salesperson when I'm selling advertising to, to different advertisers is to tell them, is to avoid saying no. Um, even when I get stupid questions, <laughs> trying to answer them in a way that, you know, not being, without being condescending or anything else, but just trying to find what's the right way that I can give an answer that's honest and truthful and sincere, but is also recognizing that this is a sales opportunity and I have to be approaching it in the right way. And I think that that influences how developers build their apps. I think it influences how you handle, certainly how you handle customer service and customer support, um, let alone the marketing side of, of the development business. And so I think for me, the talk is going to focus on how leveraging the kinds of things that have to become second nature to me as a salesperson, how using those kind of sales techniques or the sales mentality yeah. can help success in all, in many other aspects of business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it's a very good idea because most of us developers are um, not so good at many other stuff. Like we're not so good at marketing. We're not so good at selling. We are most of the time not so good at designing. Uh, and uh, that's actually um, interesting because uh, f uh, it's, it's not only about developing an app. And, and the app being perfect. Once you get the app out there, it's not very helpful if you cannot sell it. So um, I really look forward to 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 this talk, actually. So uh, yeah, thanks. We'll, we'll see how it turns, and especially as a, as a workshop, we'll, we'll see how it really turns, and with the feedback with people, and and 
we'll see that. If I recall correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you did this this thing at NS conference where you actually showed the people what what they could have seen because there were also many other talks. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's 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 the one I was referring was, to. Where at, at, yeah, at NS conference, that yeah. uh, Scotty had said, you know, maybe we'll avoid the podcaster talk, but I, I did just a few slides yeah, of yeah, it because yeah, it fit into yeah, the broader yeah, talk that yeah. I was doing there. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I mean, I, I'm also keen on seeing your slides. I remember those slides with just <laughs> one or two words on the slides, which is, I think, totally the way to go. I am myself always making the mistake of writing uh, long uh, sentences on the slides, and uh, um, yeah, we'll see. Anyway. Uh, the advantage of, of having fewer words on the slide, obviously from the audience perspective, it means they pay a little bit more attention mm, to mm, you versus mm. staring at the screen. The hard part is uh, it ends up meaning I have to do a lot more rehearsing to make sure I know yeah. all the things I want to say. Although I don't know if you ever have done that, but I saw recently uh, when I was in Paris at Dot Swift, I saw Daniel Steinberg. He did something pretty cool with the slides, which is some of the slides, he didn't have to uh, read them. We had to read them and they turned out to be funny. Because he was sometime like asking a question, and the answer was there, big. We read it, we laughed, and he kept on. Um, yeah, that was a very, very smart move, and and Daniel is certainly a very good speaker. Sure, yeah, that's great. Uh, let's move to the second one, which is the actual talk, or actually the actual keynote, I would say, because this is gonna what's gonna set the tone. It's speaking about Apple, which is interestingly. Uh, a little bit of a recurring team because the first year uh, we had Mike Lee speak about uh, so the talk was called WWSJD what would Steve Jobs do right uh, which is an amazing talk which is still online in 2012 uh, so yeah so with you we will learn about Apple's mistakes and you know it's hard to look at Apple and say oh, <laughs> they they've made mistake. a lot of mistakes because <laughs> yeah. whatever mistakes they're making, it's very profitable for them and they're doing just fine. Yeah. But I think, you know, I think there are plenty of people at Apple who would acknowledge that mistakes have been made on occasion. Yeah, and uh, you know, regardless of the size of a mistake, um, whether it's something that's really impactful to their business or whether it's much more minor, uh, the way Apple handles it when it's made a mistake, I think, can be very educational and there's two different ways that apple handles mistakes and that's kind of what the talk is about sometimes it tries to ignore them and you know say it's it's not really a problem it's not us it's you um and that's one approach not the one i would endorse and on better occasions apple is able to say you know what we made a mistake and here's how we're going to handle it like embrace the mistake and say we've screwed up and here's what we're going to do instead now yeah um and that's that's kind of and i think that both aspects are educational and so when i talk about learning from apple's mistakes it's the idea that sometimes they do it exactly right and you want to emulate them and sometimes they don't really handle it right and here's how you could do better mm -hmm. apple can get away with making more mistakes than many of us can because they've got plenty of money to <laughs> to fix over anything yeah but uh, i think it can be there's, I think there's a lot to learn from from how they handle it in both ways. Uh, that, you know, I, I love I love watching these talks in general, but I always am appreciative when there's actionable advice versus philosophical. I mean, I like both, but mm -hmm. I want to be able to I want to go away and say, okay, uh, here's a thing that I could start doing differently now, and that's that's the kind of thing that I'm hoping at least to be able to impact with that talk. So I'm not actually sure at all what you're going to speak about, but I know that uh, from a from a hardware perspective, they actually made very little mistakes, except if you consider the Pippin or the Newton being mistakes, for example. Uh, right. From a software perspective, they're very good at doing mistakes, and we all have, uh, a, a, we all remind uh, things like Maps and uh, or any other thing like iCloud. The rule of thumb that I have a lot of time as a developer when when I analyze the new technologies coming from Apple is I, I say a lot of time, uh, I ask myself the question, does it involve the internet? Does it involve networking? Uh, no, they're not very good at that. Uh, it's very interesting. It seems like Apple's DNAs are just not on the cloud it's somehow. And, it, you know, it's the fact that so many people, not just developers, but regular customers, are now distrustful of iCloud at best and, conf or, you know, I would say confused by it at best and distrustful of it at worst uh, is really problematic because it's hard to claw your way back. Mm -hmm. You know, when so many people are willing to say, sure, I'll trust Dropbox to do exactly what it says it's going to do and to sync everything everywhere. But when people are like, iCloud is a mess and I'm scared to use it, that's even for a company as big as Apple, yeah. assuming they get the technology right, which is no easy feat on its own. 
to to win back everybody's trust on that front and say, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna switch over to doing everything in iCloud now is that's gonna be an uphill battle. iCloud does a lot of a very good thing, like the photo synchronizing the photo works brilliantly, or the calendars or the contacts, whatever. As soon as you start touching things like uh, the iWork pages syncing we tried today for example with my colleagues at work we we're using google docs to to share some notes for a podcast we were recording and then our android developers said that's actually pretty funny you guys are using google docs and so i was a little bit pissed off and i say come on let's let's try to use iWork." and no way that just doesn't yeah. work <laughs> no and it's it's it, even when it works it's not as good nope. and that's it's a problem not in this case well, yeah. I, anyway, I'm very excited. Uh, we'll see. Uh, we, we still like, have a couple of months. So uh, thank you for taking the time with us. Uh, hey, my pleasure. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it too. Yeah. I, just, I have to book my flight at some point. But yeah. <laughs> once I get that done, I'm ready to go. Yeah. Maybe you should remind people uh, how they can follow you uh, and where they can find sure. you. Sure. So I'm uh, on most places where you could follow me, like Twitter, et cetera. You'll find me at Lex Fry, L-E-X-F-R-I. Um, or you can find me at LexFriedman.com, and that'll link to all the different places you can find stuff I do. Okay, cool. Thank you very much, and see you in Cologne. Thank you. Bye. Bye.